So up till now, for the most part, I just gave you the principal stresses. Mm -hmm. we, we did talk about at least the vertical stress, you can estimate it, uh, but we haven't really talked about ways to measure the principal stresses. Uh, and specifically, uh, we're usually talking about measuring S3 or one of the, one of the and S3 many times is a horizontal principal stress, but uh, not always. And one of the ways we can do that is uh, with hydraulic fracturing. So in this case, I have a little cartoon here that shows you know, hydraulic fracturing in the horizontal well, sort of your typical stimulation, right? Hydro hydraulic fracturing from a stimulation standpoint. Here we're not using it to stimulate the well. We're using it, well, we use it as purely a diagnostic test. Um, and so the, the sort of cartoon is not to scale. I mean, we're not, we're not gonna grow giant fractures. We're gonna grow very small fractures close to the well bore as purely a diagnostic test. But what the cartoon does illustrate is sort of this classic notion that hydraulic fractures will grow in the direction that's perpendicular to the minimum horizontal stress. Right. So if we, if we open a fracture, the normal force on that fracture is the minimum horizontal stress Okay, unless, <laughs> unless you're in a scenario where the, min the, min the minimum stress would be the vertical stress, and then in that case the fractures would grow in a plane like that, right? And that's why I said S3, okay? But typically, uh, your, your fractures are gonna grow in a direction minimum to S3 or minimum to horizontal stress. And so if you, have a, if you have a fracture and you're opening it, and the force resisting that opening, you're opening it with a pressure, the force resisting that opening, normal to that, um, then just some through basically equilibrium arguments, when the instant that fracture closes, at that instant you're in equilibrium. The, fr the fluid, the pressure inside the fracture and the, and the pressure pushing against the fracture is in equilibrium. And so if you can identify that instant, then you can say that that is the normal stress or S3. Okay. And again, uh, yeah, so, and, and also just keep in mind that, I mean, this is just a, a cartoon, and, and we're gonna talk about hydraulic fracture from a stimulation standpoint quite in detail, and, and all the mechanics associated with that later in a few weeks. But, um, you know, this picture, keep in mind, this picture is sort of the classic notion uh, in that these, the, these long, bi-wing, straight, planar fractures these sort of tend to only occur in conventional formations. In shales, where you have lots of um, natural fractures and other things in the rock, uh, then you, you, you get a lot more complexity than this kind of straight bi-wing planar fracture, but that's, that's sort of to be left to discuss later, but nevertheless, uh, that's the cartoon I have. Um, so, if we go back to the Kirsch equations for a minute, uh, the tangential stress, look at the tangential stress at the well bore. So this is the simplified Kirsch equations at the well bore in terms of the hoop stress, if you will, right, theta, theta. And this is in a vertical well where we have you know, the, the equations correspond to the principal stresses. And if you remember that sigma theta theta cycles, right? As you go around the well, it, go, it goes to maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum. So the, at the minimum value is where you're, well, let's just, you know, if you're talking about um, basically the stress theta theta, um, then as you go around the well bore, you get this kind of behavior. And it, you know, if this is zero stress, the minimum is the closest to zero, which, or, or if you extended that into the negative regime, you could say that maybe there's some T zero. So if the rock had some tiny amount of tensile, so this is stress here, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say it's sigma theta theta, but rather just sigma, it's effective stress. Uh, as a function of, say, theta, right? Then, the, the, then this line maybe corresponds to sigma theta theta. So the hoop stresses you go around the well bore, 
Um, under certain under, under certain conditions, uh, the, this minimum value here, which is what this equation corresponds to, can approach zero, or possibly if the rock has some small tensile strength, the rock has some small tensile strength. If that value approaches that, then that's going to induce a tensile a tensile failure. Okay, and so. Uh, and this this equation may look a little different because that's this temperature term in there, but you can sort of ignore that. Um, so then, basically, the, the the point is is that where this reaches a where this reaches a, a minimum and becomes into tension, then that's going to be corresponding to the SH min, and so. I don't know. It's probably easier to just think about, in this case, not not even using the mathematics of the equation, but just think about the equilibrium argument I was making earlier, right? So, if, you, if you're, you're trying to open a fracture and you have fluid in the so let's just forget all this. And if you have a fracture and it's pressurized. And you have some normal force, okay. If the fracture is not growing, okay, so if it's growing, the pressure is going to be fluctuating, okay. But if the, if the fracture is not growing, or at the instant that the fracture closes, and the fracture closes, it's not growing, right? The instant the fracture closes, then the, fra the fluid inside the pressure and the pressure here will be in equilibrium. Just according to the statics problem, essentially, and therefore that's going to be corresponding to the minimum stress. And so the test that we use uh, is called a leak-off test, or a mini frac, or uh, uh, formation integrity test or an extended leak off test. So there's a lot of names, and it really just is sort of the same thing. Um, it's sort of the same thing. It just really, w w the name you give it sort of corresponds to how long you carry out the test. In other words, you could, th this is pressure versus, um, well, time if it's a con, you know, you can think of the pressure versus time if you're pumping at a constant flow rate, okay? Uh, or volume if it's not at constant flow rate, but you could you could stop this at any time. Right? You don't have to carry it out all the way to the end. And so, just depending sort of where you stop this test, then it, it has different names. So we'll just sort of go through the different tests. And so, if you if you simply just while you're drilling, you stop drilling for a moment and you were to run this test where you inject fluid at a constant rate, the pressure is going to increase. So you're injecting fluid at a constant rate. There's a constant volume, the volume of the, the column of fluid in the well bore, right? Constant rate, the pressure is going to increase, right? And if you then just stop that test at some point, just stop it without going any further, then we call that a limit test. Because basically what you're saying is if, if, if all you see is this linear increase, constant volume, constant rate injection, the pressure increases linearly, you're not increasing the volume in any way. You haven't fractured anything. You haven't done anything. If you just stop the test at that point, then you call that a limit test or a formation integrity test. And that doesn't tell you what S3 is, but it tells you, it gives you a bound on it because you haven't reached it yet. So all you can say in a limit test is that, you know, at whatever pressure you stop, you know, at whatever pressure you stop the test, S3 is something bigger than that. Right. So that's a limit test or a formation integrity test. Now, if you if you carry out the test beyond that, at some point, some point you'll see an inflection in the curve. Right. At some point you'll see an inflection in the curve, and that inflection right there, this point where the two, where, where you see that inflection, is called the leak-off point. And this is 
typically, if, if all you do is run the test to here and no further, then this is going to be what your estimate of S3 is. Right? So you're going to say S3 is at the leak off point, although it's not a, always a, the best estimate. Right? And so really, uh, I guess the point of carrying out this test further and further is that the further you carry it out, the, the estimates get better and better. Okay? Um, if you just carry it out past this inflection point, you can interpret that uh, as S3. And this is due to the fact that now you've initiated a fracture. So you're increasing the volume a little bit, which has caused the slope of the curve to change. Right, so you've just initiated that fracture. Okay? And the reason it's not a great estimate is because there's issues associated, especially if, if you have um, sort of resistance right at the well bore associated with high viscosity fluids or um, if you're doing this test through a, through a um, cased well where you have perforations, then you have additional resistance, you know, additional pressure, uh, additional resistance due to the fact that the fluid has to flow through those perforations and you have sort of turbulent flow in that area and all that. And that, addition, that, that creates additional stress on the fluid, which increases the pressure. Okay. Um, so at some point, and so then if you continue to carry out the test, then the slope of the curve will drop. And the, this point is called uh, the formation breakdown point. All right. So the, the FBP, formation break, I'm sorry, the formation breakdown pressure. So what happens here is that now you're, now you're growing a fracture, and so you're increasing the volume at a rate that's faster than what, you know, you're, you're increasing the, you're pumping fluid, uh, but your, your crack is growing faster than you're pumping fluid in, and therefore you, you have a pressure drop. Okay, and so that's the formation breakdown pressure. And then you will have some plateau, and that plateau is called the fracture propagation pressure. The, the, the pressure associated with that plateau is called the fracture propagation pressure. This is probably a little bit better estimate of S3. And the reason it plateaus like that, if you remember when we talked about tensile fracture a couple of weeks ago, and you can go back and watch the video if you need a reminder, but we talked about how at the initiation of a crack, it's toughness dominated. right? So there it has to do with the stress intensity and the toughness of the rock. But once the fracture becomes long enough, then it goes into strength-dominated regime. And, and it's, that strength is, this is that sort of equilibrium regime that I was saying. And so there, uh, you're, you're, you know, there's, there's still some toughness, and that's why, that's why these points don't lay on right on top of one another. But the longer the fracture is, it's mostly the strength of the rock, or S3, that's resisting it. Okay? And so this is your... Uh, fracture propagation pressure. And then eventually, once the fracture becomes long enough, uh, you'll get to the point where you just can't, you know, sort of the, the screen out, um, and, and you won't be able to propagate the fracture anymore. You don't really typically, that would be, that would be the case in a stimulating hydraulic fracture. In these type of tests, you don't typically run it that long, okay? So at some point, while the fracture is propagating, you see this plateau, if you shut in the well, right, if you shut in the well, then you're going to see a drop off. And this, the ISIP, the initial shut in pressure, and then you have the fracture closure pressure. And in a second, we're going to zoom in on this part of the curve and do a little more interpretation of exactly what goes on here. But what you'll see is that, you know, the, the leak off point, the fracture propagation pressure, and the fracture closure pressure are all within 5% of each other, right? And so they're all decent estimates of what S3 is, but probably the best one would be the fracture closure pressure, because that, that's exactly the moment when the pressure is in equilibrium. The pressure in the fracture is in equilibrium with S3, and the fracture is closed, OK? The problem is it's a little bit hard to see it, because it, it, it occurs right here, and you need to be careful interpretation. And, you know, this is a cartoon. This is a sort of a hand-drawn picture. But the reality is a lot of times, a lot of times these readings are done by somebody just standing at the wellhead, at the drill head, looking at a pressure gauge that's bouncing around at the surface, right? 
And so, in fact, uh, if, if, if it is a reading at the surface, you have to account for the column of water, uh, the head pressure associated with the column of water in the well bore. So you'd have to add that to whatever, you know, to, to get the exact uh, S3 reader. Okay. So it's better to do these measurements, you know, down hole if you can, and, and, you know, of course, the more measurements you can take. But the reality is, is usually this is some guy standing there looking at the pressure needle bouncing and, you know, at one minute writing down what the pressure is and at two minutes writing down the pressure is in three minutes. So it's not always the, the best. Uh, yeah. Um, no. Well, again, in this in this case, you can't. See, it's not marked on here because you can't see exactly where it is. But they should be all of these: the fracture propagation pressure, the leak off pressure, and the, and the fracture closure pressure. It should all be within about five percent of each other. Uh, I would anticipate the fracture closure pressure is a little bit lower than the leak off point. And again, this has to do with the, the, the leak off point can be inflated a little bit because of near well bore stuff, right? Uh, again, perforations or if there's the, you know, viscosity, stress associated with viscosity, right? So we don't, you know, the, the fluids, the stress in a fluid is governed by, you know, or, or the, the flow of a fluid is governed by the Navier Stokes equations, right? And the stress term is like a viscosity times some sort of velocity strain thing. And so it, it, it depends on turbulence, uh, um, perforations or other things in the well bore contribute to that, which will increase the stress in the fluid, and then that would increase the pressure sort of artificially. And that, that's the things you might see at the leak off point. Um, so here's some real data. So the previous plot was, was uh, hand drawn, you know, but here, here's some real data. Uh, so there's sort of two over here. This is uh, over here. This is surface pressure versus so the function of time, and those are associated with the pressure. The pressures are these curves, and this test was done twice. That's why there's two of them. Uh, and then over here you have flow rate versus time, and these curves down here are the flow rate. Right? So. These are the flow rate. Uh, you have some kind of spikes in here. This should be near constant. So it sort of makes this first plot a little suspect to me. But for this one, you have a nice constant flow rate, you know, 15 barrels per second. Uh, and then you can clearly see the shut-in. Right? And so if, if we zoom in on this part of the curve, OK, Then you can. These are these are the data zoomed in on that part of the curve. Okay, and the, this plotted two ways. So this is the second cycle. This is the pressure versus time, and this is the pressure versus the square root of time. And you may ask, well, why why plot it as the function of the square root of time? Well, you know, under steady state, this is sort of governed by. The diffusivity equation, diffusion, right? So this is like di pressure diffusion. It is a physics that's governing this point, right? So you've stopped all flow. The fluid is just diffusing, right? Well, you know, diffusion. The diffusion equation can be derived from actually the statistics of a random walk, right? So, like, you just from a molecular standpoint, you just have little fluid molecules, and they're bouncing around in in, in Brownian motion, essentially, right? They're bouncing around and bouncing into each other and walking around. And the, the characteristic uh, of diffusion, when what makes something diffusion, is that the means, the, the distance of any trace of particle in time, the average distance of any trace of particle, any, any little molecule that's going to move around, its average distance is actually proportional to the square root of time. Right? So that's the, the sort of underlying physics of it. And, um, and so if you, plot it, if you plot it as a function of the square root of time, then what you can see is a pretty clear inflection point. So there's a pretty clear 
pretty clear inflection point in the data. Right? And that, that inflection point, that point right there, is the fracture closure pressure. And that's probably the best estimate of S3. Okay. But again, this is the test is not always carried out this far because it takes a you know it takes a I say a long time. I mean this is this is uh, three, four, seven minutes, but this this is minutes after shut in, right? So you, you carried out this whole test, so you sort of I mean, a lot of times you just do a formation integrity test. You just pressure it out, okay, we didn't fracture anything, let's keep going. But this sort of takes a takes a while. So we don't always get this this good estimate. Uh, I don't know if any of you had a had a course with uh, Dr. McClure when he was here. He's left now, but uh, he wrote a paper last year, a research article where so he's doing some you know high fidelity simulations of this DFIT test, and he's showing that you know there's actually some compliance in the fracture walls themselves because the fracture is not perfectly two flat surfaces that just mate and close, right? In reality, there's there's irregularity along the fracture wall, and so when the fractures come back into contact, they actually have some mechanical compliance. So so because of the irregularity in the fracture faces and they, when they shut on each other, there's actually some mechanical compliance and the fracture squeezes out. And he showed that, you know, the conclusion was that, you know, even this fracture closure pressure, because it doesn't take into account the mechanical compliance of the rock, that this could be off by a few percent as well. So. Probably the best we can do in the field, though, and that's the nature of petroleum engineering. It's always a little bit of uncertainty, or a lot of uncertainty. Well, just uh, probably well, draw a picture. Again, after you fracture the rock, you have you have uh, two surfaces that are sort of like this, right? And so this is this is one half space of the rock, and this is one half. And your fluid would be in here. Right? Well, as these guys come in to mate, right? Like as this this little jagged point comes down and it touches that point, it's going to deform. It's going to deform. You, you got two miles of earth sitting on top of it, right? It's going to deform. And that the deformation, the deformation right along the face. Right? Compliance is like the inverse of stiffness, right? When we talk about strength of a rock, it typically it's Young's modulus or something. So I'm just saying, you know, it'll, it'll, this thing is going to deform due to these irregularities along the surface. And that small amount of deformation there uh, would have to be to, to get a perfect estimate of S3 would have to be included into that equilibrium calculation because these are not rigid walls. Right? If it was a rigid body and rigid body, then it's what I said earlier. When the fluid pressure there, when this is not in motion anymore, the fluid pressure there is equal to, when it closes, then it's equal to S3. But because after it closes, there's some mechanical deformation, some compliance, and that causes a little bit of uncertainty. But that's <laughs> For the purpose of this class, I was just trying to give you a little anecdote that this is still an area of active research and little things like this. Um, you know, for the purposes of this class, we'll use the fracture closure pressure. That's S3. That's the best we can do. We'll stop there.